Let's just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we're coming tonight to look at a passage that perhaps we've heard many times before. A passage that is very familiar to us. But a passage that you had placed in your Bible for us to learn from us, from you, for us to think about. So we just ask tonight, as we look at these words, we won't let the familiarity put us off, distract us. We won't let our minds wander. But we'll be seeking you, seeking what it is that you want to say to us about our lives, about our witness, about our faith. Lord, be with us, we ask tonight, and just speak to us, challenge us, draw us closer to you, we ask. Amen. Amen. Originally, I was due to preach last week, but we changed a few dates around on the preaching rotor, so I ended up with this passage. And I have to say, actually, there's probably quite an irony in this. Because I'm really not all that fond of babies and young children. Perhaps it's because I haven't had children of my own, but some of my cousins have done more than enough to make up for the population. And uh, we have these family get-togethers, and these babies get passed round from person to person. You're supposed to look at them in coo and R and say, oh, look, don't they look like whichever parent you want to pick on at the time. And I have to say, in all honesty, I I dread that moment. I've learned over the years it's best to keep the head higher than the feet. Um, The kids tend to look at me and scream. Um, My dad always look at me and scream as well. That's a totally different story. Um, But so I really find that I'm in the position of the disciples. I'd probably be the one shooing the children away. So I thought I'd try and get some advice. So I was talking to some of the young people the other week, and I said to the young people, so this passage, what do you think of it? You know, let's read it, let's look at it. And the answer I got back was, well, it is what it is, isn't it? Now, that was really helpful. That gave me a lot to think about, a lot to uh, work with as I was going through the rest of the sermon. I promised I wouldn't name him. And it could have been a really short sermon if I'd stuck with that. But actually, I think God's got a lot more to tell us about this. So I wanted to unpick this passage, to have a think about it, and in my normal fashion, we can look at it at two levels. The first one is going to be the obvious level, what we actually see as we read it, what is straightforward. What do we see as we see this story? It's something, as I said, it's very familiar to us. Now this passage is recounting what I think is a fairly normal event. In fact, what you probably would describe as being common practice. And I haven't given you a lot to fill in tonight, because I want you to think about what I'm saying, to write your own notes down. So let's look at this passage, thinking about what it's talking about. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have them touch him. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. So let's start with what it tells us. What does it tell us about? It tells us that people were bringing their babies to Jesus. Now, the Jewish practice, as was laid down in Leviticus, talks about when a mother has had a baby after a period of purification. It says this, When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. So there's a ritual to be followed, a procedure, a practice. And often, the priest would then pray and bless the child. Now, have you got good memories? Okay, I'd like to take you back to what Pastor Phil preached on, on Luke chapter 2, number 7 in this series, on the 9th of November 2014. (laughs) Yep, two years ago and a bit. Do you remember what we spoke about? No, okay. Now, Phil didn't either when I asked him this morning, so it's fair, that's all right, you don't have to worry too much. You can look it up on YouTube or the podcast, which, to be honest, is what I did. And we looked at the importance of Jesus following the law, the fact that as a Jewish child, he went through the rituals and the procedures of the law. The passage started something like this. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And you'll remember at that point, Simeon was there, and that tremendous prophecy and that prayer that was prayed. And then Anna, again, that prayer that was prayed. So this was a procedure that was common practice. 
Jesus himself, his parents had followed this procedure. He'd been taken to the temple. He had been blessed. And I suspect the local people, as Jesus had been travelling around and they'd seen him, heard him preaching, heard him talking, had thought, this is a really holy man. Probably thought that he was another prophet, like the Old Testament prophets. And so they brought their children to be blessed by him, to their hands laid upon him. And let's be honest, who wouldn't want their children to be blessed, to have their hands of a holy person laid upon them? So I don't think there's anything particularly unusual or difficult in this part of the passage. However, we then come to the second part of that verse. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Now, depending on which verse from the Bible you look at, it says it sent, they sent them away. Again, probably nothing on the face of it, unusual or difficult for us to understand here. Jesus was travelling around a lot of the time. He was preaching, he was conducting miracles. The disciples were around him, and in a way, protecting him. The entourage, the bodyguard, stopping him being bothered by people, ensuring that he got some rest, that he didn't get unwanted attention. But turning children away? Our modern society, even in the church, places a great deal of importance upon children and young people. And whilst that's not a topic for today, and whether that's right or wrong, whether we sometimes place undue importance upon it, we need to understand that the Jewish society dealt with children in a very different way. In our previous sermons in Luke, and as we've realised, we've been in it for over two years now, we've been looking at the Jewish society and their rules and their regulations. And we know that women were considered as having a far lower status than men. In fact, even a few weeks ago, we were looking at the widow who had to go to court and plead herself. And it was commented on that that was really unusual. Normally, a woman wouldn't even be allowed to go into the court, let alone plead for themselves. And children were at an even lower status. Now, I'm not as old as some here, so I don't remember the Victorian age. But in those days, all oh, right, okay, one or two of you nodding, yeah, you might do, okay. In those days, children were supposed to be seen and not heard. In the Jewish society, it went even further. They weren't even supposed to be seen. The good old days, eh? Sorry, I am joking, honestly, mostly. Uh, <laughs> But as we know, Jesus wasn't actually bound by the rules. He didn't go along with the teaching of the Pharisees. He wasn't prescriptive in what he did. We sometimes refer to him from this pulpit as being counter-cultural. So you see, what Jesus did then was not common practice. Now, we've been going through Luke for a while. And we've seen that Jesus often goes to talk to the people who are the outcasts. He talks to women, even for women. This morning we spoke about John chapter 4, the woman of Samaria. That was the passage that we dealt with this morning, and I'm not going to go into it now. We've spoken about it before. But Jesus was prepared to go outside the bounds of normal society. He would talk to women. He would talk to foreign women. And in fact, if you look on through the Bible, you're going to see how often women feature in the Acts of the Apostles and on. So think about Timothy, for instance. What does Paul write? I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded, and now lives in you also. Or again, in Romans, I commend to your sister Phoebe, a servant of the church. Well, what a tremendous thing to say. Because in Jewish society, the woman would not have been considered important. They would have been left out of these things. But Jesus doesn't accept these social rules. He talks to the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the foreigners, and as we're seeing tonight, the children. Look at his reaction. But Jesus called the children to him. And he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So here we are again. Jesus is challenging the normal regulations, the normal rules. And he's challenging our perceptions of how we view ourselves and our own status. 
So here's a question for you, I think, at this point. When people come to ask about Christ, do we judge them by our own standards? Or are we prepared to let anyone come to Christ? Jesus always had time for children. In Luke chapter 9, we looked at the story of where Jesus had been talking about his own death. And the disciples had been arguing about who was going to be the greatest. What was Jesus' response to that one? He took a child, stood him beside him, and then challenged them on what their faith and their belief was. Because he said, it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Jesus didn't just accept that there were people out there who were different, who were outcasts. He actually wanted them to come to him. He actually wanted to draw them to him. They were important. So our passage, as we look at it initially, ends with a bit of a challenge. It's a challenge to the disciples, to those around, and to us as we're thinking about it. Because he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So what is he saying? What is he actually trying to challenge us about? Is he saying, you people with your ideas, your rules, your regulations, your traditions, your habits, the things you do, you're not going to get into heaven? Or is he actually saying that to each one of us, we need to think differently, think from a different point of view? So that's the quick overview of the passage. That's the quick review of it is what it is, isn't it? But I want us to look a little bit deeper into it. I want us to go back and think about some of the characters and what we can learn from them. You see... Phil was talking earlier on when he was doing the reading that we have to look at things in context. And, and he was kind enough to go back and read a little bit more in the passage rather than just the verses I'm preaching on today. We know that Luke, at the very beginning of this gospel, says that he's going to tell his gospel in an ordered and logical account of the story of Jesus. So although we've broken it into really small segments for our preaching, you can mention how long the sermons would have been if we tried to do it all in one go, it's important to look at the context that the passage is put in. Look at the preceding passage. Now, you struggled with November 2014. Can you remember last week? Okay, a few nods. A few, yeah. We were looking at the taxpayer and the Pharisee and their prayers, and we were being challenged to think about who actually met with God. Next week, we're looking at the rich young ruler, about a man who had said that he had obeyed every commandment, Yet that still wasn't enough. So why, in the middle of these two stories, has Luke suddenly thrown in this bit about the children? It seems out of context, out of place. But it isn't. It's positioned there to make us think that actually these stories are to reflect us and to look forward to where we're going. So we've looked at the straightforward and now I want to try and look at what I think is the hidden meaning in this passage. I want to do that by looking at the characters we meet, as opposed to the situation we necessarily meet them in. So let's start with the children, the babies, the little ones. Now I said earlier on that I'm not tremendously fond of young babies, but I've got to be honest, as they get older they become more entertaining, don't they children? Entertaining is a, a loose description in inverted commas. And I think particularly for men, and I'm, I'm, I'm blaming the men for this, because I'm told by Jackie that's what I should do, we like it when they get to an age where they're quite trusting and believing and they accept what we're telling them. So some years ago, when Jackie and I were first married, we were going on holiday, and I was aware that the boys sitting in the back of the car were sometimes quite startled if a motorbike came past us quite quickly. So I saw a motorbike coming up, and I warned them that there was a motorbike coming up, and they said, oh, how did you see that motorbike coming up? And I said, we've got really bright lights on. So we had a discussion about the lights on the motorbike, and I explained to them that my father, when he was in the RAF at Odium, doing his national service, had had a motorbike to get back up into Essex. Now, obviously in those days, and you'll have to go with this, you have to pretend you're young for a moment or two, they didn't have electric lights. So what my dad had was a white candle on the front and a red candle on the back of his bike. 
This, of course, led to a problem that if he went too fast, the candles would blow out. So what he had to do was to get some broken glass and some chewing gum, because obviously blue tack wasn't around in those days. I mean, we're talking a long time ago. This was just after the war. And he had to try and prop some glass up using blue tack. For a while, Josh and Dan believed this story. Until they met my father and explained to him that they were sorry to hear about this motorbike and how interesting it had been. And there was a long pause. My father looked at me and said, you stupid boy. <laughs> now, that's the bit the boys have remembered ever since, the stupid boy bit. <laughs> yeah. or alternatively, my parents live in Littlehampton now, so when we go down there, of course, when they were younger, we had to be very quiet when you go past Arundel. You do know this, don't you? If you're not quiet when you go past Arundel, the giant will come out of the castle and chase you down the road. You see, children have a really simple belief, don't they? It's straightforward. They don't try and overcomplicate things. I can see some of you struggling with this, so I want to take another example. Do you like having stories read to you? Do you like reading stories to young children? So, if you're all sitting comfortably, then I will begin. Once upon a... Because we know that's how the stories begin. That's always the way good stories start, isn't it? It's going to be once upon a... So here we go. Once upon a strategy... Defined by meetings with our key customer focus groups, tested by our infield experts, and checked to be in line with our company ISO 9001 standards, and of course signed off by the managing trustees. It just doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work, it doesn't come as a story. It's not what you expect, it's not what you want. You see, children want something that's simple and straightforward, something they can grasp. It doesn't have to make total sense to them. So I believe that Lucas put this passage here. In between this story about the Pharisee and the taxpayer, and before we get to the rich young ruler, to say to us, don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. Try and come to what I'm saying to you like a child. We don't have to understand everything that God is planning. We don't have to see that everything makes logical sense according to our brains and our minds. We need to be like the children. We need to have some of their qualities. So I was trying to think about what were the qualities of children. Difficult. I was trying to find the good ones. So I've listed a few here, and here's some thoughts on them. So trust. Children really trust adults. They trust their parents. You can say to them, jump off the wall, I'm going to catch you. And most of the time we do. You can say to them, we're going to go and do this. Or don't worry, I'll sort that out. And they do. How good are you at trusting God? next one down is love. There's a simplicity in a child's love for their parents. It's not complicated by grudges and by what you said to them last week. They have an unmitigated love for their parents. It's a difficult thing to talk about, but sometimes when you hear these victims talking about abuse that they had at home, there is still a love for their parents. It overrides everything. And that challenges me. Sometimes when I'm annoyed with the way God's doing things. Sometimes when I'm annoyed about the fact that things aren't going the way I want them to. How does my love for God do? Does it wax and wane? They're uninhibited, aren't they? Children don't have a problem going to talk to other children. We were talking the other week as elders about how sometimes people are at the back of church and they're a little bit by themselves and people aren't talking to them. But when you watch children together, they don't have that problem. They go and fight each other, but they go and interact with each other, don't they? They go and talk. They're not worried about the race or the class of somebody else. They're not worried about whether they're wearing the right clothes or turned up in slippers. They're not worried about how they're looking. They're just interested in going to talk to them. Dependent. Children are dependent. They don't try and do things necessarily on their own. They know that they're going to get food. They know they're going to get clothes. They know they're going to be taken to school. They know they're going to be brought back. So here's a question for you. How reliant, how dependent are you upon God? Or do you try and do it in your own strength, in your own way? Here's an example that I struggle with on this front. I like to think to myself that I'm fairly good at talking. I can talk quite a bit. 
So when I decide that during this coming week, I want to go and witness to somebody, my mouth goes dry, my tongue ties itself up in knots. At the end of the week, I can see all the opportunities I missed because I'm trying to do it in my own strength. I'm trying to do it in my own way. I'm trying to engineer situations to get together with somebody and talk to them. Engineer a situation to talk to them about God. But that isn't the way of doing it. It's not us thinking, have I got the right words, the right mannerisms, the might. I don't know, whatever it is, the thing you think is the right way of doing it. It's about God creating the situation. It's about being dependent upon God to use you as he wants to use you. Now, it's easy sometimes when you're up here to Sunday, you're blowing your own trumpet, but it's interesting that sometimes, when I look back, the people I've had the best conversations with have come up totally by accident, totally when I wasn't expecting it, and I've not had time to plan it, to think about it. I've had to stop and say, I've been asked this question, God, how am I going to respond to it? Give me the right words. So, I don't know what your situation is. It might be witnessing. It might be your job. It might be your home. It might be your family. What is it that challenges you? And are you actually relying on God for it, or are you trying to do it in your own strength? Uncomplicated. That's why I put all the points on one slide, because I find it difficult to keep memory to change the slides, so I thought I'd put them all on one slide, so it's simple, straightforward, and obvious. So I wonder again, do we overcomplicate our faith and our religion? Now, I've been in church since I was six weeks old, um, so that's a few years. And I've been in different kinds of churches. I've been in Church of England churches, I've been in Baptist churches, I've been in FIC churches, I've been in Brethren, I've been in Quakers. I've been to a range of um, different kinds of styles and bits and pieces. And what I've learned is that every church has its habits, traditions. It can be as simple as we always lay the chairs out this way. Um, we always stand for this song, we'll always sit for this song. If you're a stranger, actually, it becomes quite, you know, you walk in, you're a guest there, you're a visitor, you're thinking, what's going on here? Because it isn't always straightforward and obvious, is it? And when I come to my relationship with God, I sometimes try to make God fit into my mindset, my thoughts, my way of doing things. God, I've got this problem, and here's how I want you to sort it out for me. But it shouldn't be like that. We should be saying to God, I've got this problem, God. Show me how you're going to solve it. Help me to solve it. Lead me on, lead me through it. Not boastful is my next one. Oh boy, is this one I struggle with. I hear myself saying, and I heard myself saying it today in this very building. Do you know, I spent every evening at church this week doing God's service. Isn't that a terrible thing to be saying? You ought to be saying to yourself, actually, do the things in the background. You don't need to be at the front. Be grateful for what God's asked you to do, not boasting about what he's asked you to do. So when you're saying, I've been doing things at church, try and say it humbly. Try and say it in the right way, because we're here to serve. And obviously, I'm good at being humble. Now, I've written status, but I suppose for status, it actually probably could be about material things. You know, a child isn't particularly worried about the quality of their clothes. They're just interested in the fact they are warm, or they're cold, or they're dry. Obviously, that seems to change overnight as they become teenagers, where what they're wearing becomes really important. Then you get a little bit older, guys, and you'll find you really don't care that much anymore. <laughs> Jackie does. <laughs> so they're not that worried about the mature things and they're not worried about their status so here's another one about status I work in uh, an environment where I build lots of offices for other companies um, in the construction industry and I find it interesting as I go round from companies and obviously I'm not going to name who they are how directors get certain different perks you know if you're that level of director you get a 5 square metre office a little bit higher up you can get a 10 square metre office and if you're really good, you can have a corner office with two lots of windows. Do I need to have a dedicated parking space at my office? 
Or in the church, do we do the same thing? Do we worry about our status, how people think of us, where we are in the pecking order? You know, should the elders and deacons have an automatic bypass to the front of the tea and coffee queue? Just a thought, you know. <laughs> yeah, we get pushed to the back, Peter, I know. <laughs> where do we think about our status in the church? You know, it's good to be serving, but not if that serving takes us away from being focused on God, is it? I guess the only anxiety that children probably have is when they're separated from their parents. A lost child will make a big fuss. I'm lost. I'm alone. I've been deserted. I don't know where my parents are. So there's another thought for you. And I think it happens to us all. There comes a time when we're not walking as close to God as we have been in the past. We stray away. What kind of fuss do you make when you're not as close to God as you were? So I say, I think within, you know, looking at the children, there's quite a bit to learn. And then we come to the troublemakers, the disciples. So let's think about the disciples. They're the people who follow Jesus, those who spent a lot of time with him, who studied him, who claim to be close followers of him, to be his helpers. He has to be good, upright Christians, so like you and me sitting in this congregation today. So were they actually supporting him? Were they actually helping him? Uh, Jackie has a, a saying that there are two words that begin with H. Help, hindrance. What are you, as a follower of Christ? Are you a help? Are you a hindrance? Do you attract people to Jesus? Do you attract people to come to the church? Or does your behaviour, your attitude, dare I say you're snobbery, oh, I'm a Christian, you know, put them off? Do we drive them away? As I said before, you know, you go to some churches, there's a church not far away from here where I, you know, You're not wearing a tie. You can't possibly play the piano today. Is it about the way we dress? Now, I'm of an era where you dressed up in your best to come to church. I've said that before from here. But it doesn't worry me if people aren't in nice clothes. What worries me is if they're not inside that door listening to what God's saying. So what causes us to be like that? Is it our pride? Is it our disbelief? Is it our habits? Is it the rituals, the traditions of the church? Are they put off by the strange songs we sing? Or is it just the strange people who speak? What is this passage teaching us about ourselves? What are we like as disciples? Are we that help? Or are we that hindrance? Now, in your outline, I've put a different verse there. If you want to, if you've got time, have a look at it and see if you can think the route I was going to go down from here. But I decided not to. I read the sermon again yesterday and thought, you know what? I don't think we're going to have time for that, and I don't think it's going to be helpful. But it'll be challenging. I'll be interested to see how many of you can come back next week and work out where my brain had gone, because I was a bit confused. Then we meet the third person, and this is probably the most important character in our story, isn't it? It's Jesus. You see, Jesus never puts people off, be it women, be it the lepers, be it the tax collectors, be it the prostitutes, be it the children. He welcomes them all. Yes, okay, he does say about his requirements, his standards. So with the rich young ruler next week, we're going to see that just legalistically following rules and regulations isn't enough. There has to be a faith. There has to be a commitment. But I want you to look at Jesus' approach in a number of verses. Come, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We know that when he's calling the disciples. And he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. (coughs) What we're seeing here is Jesus' pattern. We're supposed to be like Jesus, growing more like him. We shouldn't be pushing people away. We shouldn't be rebuking them, saying, Clear off, don't disturb the master. We should be saying, Come. Because, you know, Jesus is always there for people. This is a verse I love. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, 
not just some people, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. That is a tremendous invitation, isn't it? That is a tremendous example for us. So we've looked at the three main sets of characters, the children and what we can learn from them. We've looked at the disciples and the warning that it is for us. And then we've looked at Jesus and his example. But you know, when I get to the end of a passage, I always like to think of a way to apply it because I think it's easy to sit here sometimes and listen to what's been said and walk out the door and leave it here. But that isn't what we as the church are about. It's about taking what we've learned and applying it and making it useful to our everyday lives. So, unsurprisingly, applications. So here are just three questions that came to me. I originally had 15. I thought that's probably too many for a conclusion. No? Yeah, okay, fine. So I want you to think about these three in particular, but if there's other things you've been challenged about, just bear them in mind during the next few weeks. Particularly as you come towards Christmas. This is a time when we get the most opportunity to talk to people, isn't it? To invite them, not only to the church and the things that are going on here, great as that is, but more importantly, to invite them to Christ. So, what is your mindset? Do you overcomplicate things when you're thinking about Christian things? Do you try to be too clever in your relationship with God? Do you trust him with the simplicity of a child? Do you find that you're studying the latest Greek interpretation of the Holy Scriptures? Or are you concentrating on the fact that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, will guide you in what's being said to you? What is your approach? When you're talking to other people, but to invite them to church, or perhaps they're guests who've come to this church, or perhaps you're talking to them at work, school, I don't know, Asda, you know, buying a load of cakes because you're going to bring them into church and get them into a conversation about it. Is the way you go about talking about it going to attract people to Jesus or repel them? What would your reaction be if somebody who didn't fit our normal standards arrived at church? I don't know. A drunk. If a drug user walked through that back door tonight, a tramp arrived. Someone's got a load of tattoos, someone's got a shaved head. Peter's not here tonight. But, you know, how good are we at overlooking the physical appearance of people and talking about their needs and talking about the person who's got all the answers to needs? And lastly, what is it that Jesus is saying to you? Now, it may be that you think all of that applies to you. It may be you think only part of it applies to you. We've looked at a message that relates around children, their simplicity. We looked at a message that talked about disciples and whether you're actually being effective and efficient as a disciple. We've looked at the example of Jesus. And the fact he's asking people to come to him. What's he saying to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're conscious that at times our brains overtake us, that we try to think and overcomplicate our relationship with you. Lord, because at the end of the day, that message of salvation is simple. Anyone who comes to trust you, to obey you, to follow you, is saved for eternal life. Lord, as we thank you for that, we just ask that perhaps at times we'll go back to the basics. We'll go back to the simple things. And we'll learn to rely upon you and to trust you. Lord, most of us here tonight are Christians. We claim to be your followers, to be your disciples. Lord, take us and use us. Make us like you to attract people to you, not the kind of person who repels people and rebukes them. Lord, help us to be encouraging, positive, a glowing light in this dark world in which you've put us. Father, above all, use us 
for your glory. Amen.